If you may please open your Bible, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. If you're not familiar with the Bible, the last book of the Bible is the book of Revelation. You walk back and you find 1 John. While you find 1 John, I, will, I would like to ask you a question. Have you noticed, have you, have you observed that a lot of people like to quote 1 Corinthians 13? Christians and non-Christians love to quote or cite 1 Corinthians 13. For good reasons. It's a beautiful description of love. It tells us that, it teaches us that love is patient and kind, that love does not envy or boast, that love is not arrogant or rude, is not resentful, love rejoices with the truth, love never ends. Indeed, it's a beautiful description of love. But what happens if I'm not like that? So what happens if I envy? What happens if I'm arrogant or rude? How do I deal with that? What happens if I'm impatient or unkind? I think 1 Corinthians 13 describes love for us, but doesn't teach us how to become people of love. I think 1 John 4 teaches us how to become people of love. So if 1 Corinthians is describing love, 1 John is teaching us how to become that. So let's read 1 John chapter 4, verses 7, 11. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Let's pray one more time. Heavenly Father, we ask you that you will be with us. Father, thank you that we can come before you, a holy God, knowing that you listen to us, that we can approach you because we come in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Christ. We ask you, Father, that your Spirit will guide us, that you speak to us, and because of that, we will love you and we will love others. Help us in Christ, we pray. Amen. For the context of these verses, uh, in the first six verses, John is addressing the church and he's telling them that they need to test all the spirits. He said, not all the spirits, not all of those who will come to the church to, pro uh, to profess to be Christian are from God. And he's, in verse 2, in this chapter, he tells us that those who do not confess that Christ came in the flesh are not from God. So for the sake of context, to understand what he's addressing, the first chapter of this book, he's describing to them, he's addressing a heresy in the first century of the church, knows, it was known as docetism. It was a Gnostic cult that they argue that everything that is physical is evil and bad, and only what was a spirit was good. Therefore, they said, God did not become a human being. So what you saw, they said, was a ghost. And John says, like, you are from Satan. Because we proclaim the one that we touch, the one that we saw, the one that we heard, the one that we ate with. It says, if anyone rejects that Christ became a human being for us and our salvation, that is not from God. It's from the Antichrist, he says. So that is the context in which he's addressing these verses that we just read. 
And the reason is that he now, he changed the focus and he addressed them with beloved. He's writing to them as a pastor who loves them. He loves, he loves the people he's writing to. He calls them my little children. There's an affection that he has for them. And he, the reason he, in this context of talking about testing the spirit that he brings love, it is because that task of discerning truth from error can be a risky one. Why? Because sometimes we can become so obsessed with truth that truth and doctrine can become an idol. That we are so focused in what is truth, in what is true, that we become kind of like bulldogs of theology. We're always angry and we're always questioning all people that we will become like full of knowledge in our head, but empty of love in our heart. And John tells us, you have to discern truth from error, but in doing so, please do not lose love. So that is the context in which he addresses here. So he's, he introduces this section with beloved reestablishing a one and affectionate language that he used in previous chapters. He loved the people he's writing to. In fact, the word, the word love appears in this book more than any book of the Bible. So only in this chapter, the, the word love in different forms in the Greek appears 27 times. So there's a lot of love in these chapters here. So for those of you who take note, and I believe that is in, in, in your Bulletin, I have one point. A God who is love will have children who love. A God who is love will have children who love. And we will see that in two parts. First, verses 7 and 8, God is love. And then, verses 9 to 11, God's love is revealed in sending his son. Let's read again verses 7 and 8. Beloved. Let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not know, who does not love, does not know God, because God is love. He urged them to love one another, for love is from God. Love belongs to God's nature. It's woven into who he is. It is part of what it means to be God. The fire gives heat because it's heat. The ice makes us make you cold because it's cold. So God loves because he is love in himself. And those who are united to God, those who have been born of God, will love. A God who is love will have children who love. And that's the point that John is communicating here. In the new birth, in that spiritual birth, in the new creation, in that supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in us, love becomes part of who we are. That's why in a very clear language, John tells us in verse 8, that if you do not love, you do not know God. Because God is love. In fact, later in this chapter, verse 20, you don't have to go there, John says that a failure to love truly is an indication of an unregenerate heart. That means a heart that has not been born of God, that is a non-Christian. Because faith and love go together. Faith and love are kind of the two sides of a coin. You cannot have one without the other. A pastor writing in the 16th century, he said, if anyone separates faith from love, it is as if he were trying to take away heat from the sun. You cannot do that. In some sense, John here is speaking about love the way that James speaks about works. If I don't love, I don't have faith. The way we treat others, the way we see other people, it speaks of an internal reality within 
us. If we are in him, we will display his holy and loving character. If we have been born of God, we will display the character of God. God is love. You see, the Bible never says that God is wrath. Never. The Bible says God is spirit, God is love, God is holy, but never says God is wrath. Why? Because wrath does not describe his essence, his nature. The wrath of God is the manifestation of his holiness towards sin. But there was a moment in history when there was not sin. It is after the fall that sin came into the world. So if you want to know God truly, you need to look at his love. Because love describes his own essence, his nature, who he is. And that love, it is eternal, as God himself is eternal. He doesn't need us to exercise that love. And that is important for us to understand. Because sometimes we speak like if God needs us. Well, he was alone, so he created us so that he could love. No. God exists in an eternal relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in which love has always been there. There was not a moment where there was not love because God is love in himself. He does not need us to love, but he created us so that we can participate and enjoy that triune, loving relationship that he has between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's why the Lord Jesus in John 17, you don't have to go there, but you know, John, he wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote the three letters, and then he he wrote the book of Revelation. So in the Gospel, you know, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In chapter 17, he says, the Lord Jesus, Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Then verse 24, he says, so that they can see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. This should teach us to be humble. He doesn't need us, yet he created us so that we can enjoy that love, that love that he has with his son before the foundation of the world. God is love in himself. He's perfect in himself. He's self-sufficient. God is God. And that's the point that John is communicating here. He's connecting the nature of God with the new birth. If we have been born again, If we have been born of God, if we are united to Christ, we will love. Now, in verses 9 to 11, John takes our attention to the main manifestation of that divine love in human history. Let's read it, verse 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. John here speaks of the purpose and the manifestation of that love. Verse 9, so that we might live through him. Verse 10, to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means that the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, received the wrath of the Father. And he died and he received the penalty of our sins. So that if we repent of our sin and we put our faith in him, we will be made new in him. You know, the Bible teaches that God created the world He created men and women. 
He created everything through his word, that everything was good. When he created us, he said it was very good. But we sin against God. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death, that the God will not leave the guilty unpunished because he's holy and perfect, so he will not leave us without condemnation, but he's good and merciful. So he sent his son, the eternal son of the father. He was born and he became like us, and he lived the perfect life that we should have lived. And he died the death that we deserved. And God raised him from the dead, declaring victory over death. If we repent of our sin and we put our faith in him, we will be made alive. We that were death in our, dead in our sin, now we receive life in Jesus. He who is God, the eternal Son of God became like us so that we will become like him. He endured our emotions. He weep. He wept so that we would not weep. He was hungry. He was alone so that we would not be alone. And he invites us to enjoy that relationship the greatest manifestation of God's love is an unilateral action to satisfy his own wrath, his own justice. You see, theologians will speak about the person of Christ and the work of Christ. And the reason they do that, so the person is to describe who he was and the work to describe what he accomplished. The challenge is that sometimes they do that in such a way that they separate the two. And you will not understand what he is doing, what he's accomplishing, if you don't understand who he is. He was not just a man that followed God, or a good philosopher, or just a man that was empowered by the Spirit of God. No, he is God himself, who took, who appropriated, who took on himself that which was ours, to heal us and to save us in himself. So we have to understand that when he was in Mary's womb, he was still sustaining the universe in his hands. We have to understand that when she was holding him, Christ was holding her. It is the eternal son of God, the eternal son of the Father, God himself, who came like us to make us one with him. In other words, This is the way that I would like to summarize, is God gave himself to himself to save us from himself. And I will repeat that because it can be confusing. God gave himself to himself to save us from himself. It is God that gave us God, the Son of God, to save us from his justice and wrath. And that's important to understand because sometimes we read like books like Narnia, we watch the movie, and I think C.S. Lewis definitely got it wrong there, uh, is when he said, you know, that one of the children, uh, I think it was Lucy, she committed sin, and then the witch came, and said, well, the, you know, the child has to die, and then the lion came and said, no, I will die on behalf of the child to satisfy the witch. Well, that's wrong, because God owns nothing to Satan. He died to satisfy his own justice. It, the sacrifice was received by him so that his own justice was, will be satisfied because he is holy and perfect and he will not leave the guilty unpunished. So he himself took on himself the punishment that we deserve. So if you're not a Christian and you're here, I invite you to repent of your sin and to put your faith in Christ Jesus. If you have questions, I'm sure Pastor Andrew and other leaders of the church would love to talk more about you after the service. I, I like to use this language of love to describe the Lord Jesus. You know, John, who wrote the Gospel of John, 
in chapter 1, verse 1, he said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In, chapter, in verse 14, in that chapter 1, he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw the glory of the one only begotten Son of the Father, full of truth and grace. So, think about Jesus as love. So love became flesh, and love walked among us, so that we that were unloving, now we are the object of his love. And by being the object of his love, now we will love him and we will love others. I think that is beautiful, because it describes the essence of who God is and the way that he has loved us. He who is loved by nature made us love by participation. He who is the son by nature made us sons and daughters by adoption. So that's why John also emphasized that the nature and the origin of love does not lie in our response to God. That is not where love begins. Love is, and love begins with God himself. And if there's anything that we do that can be called love, it, it will be because we are connected or united with God by adoption. That is, by I mean, repenting of our sin and putting our faith in Christ. It is not our ability to love that caused the new birth. Rather, our ability to love flows from our regeneration in Christ. You see what the text says in verse 9. nine he loved us when we were unlovable and unloving. And by loving us, he made us loving. And that reminds us of the main point. A God who is love will have children who love. Brothers and sisters, the sad reality is that many times we fail to love. Many times we fail to love. I was, a few months ago, I was talking with a friend of mine who, who's a pastor. And he was describing to me a situation that took place in a church in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, there was a, a couple, a family, a husband and wife. They, had a, they have a daughter. I think she was 15 at that point. Uh, this uh, young lady, she got pregnant. When that happened, uh, that couple felt felt that everything collapsed, that the world was collapsing in front of them. They did not know what to do. They were in tears. They were crushed. So after some conversation, I don't know what was going on in their mind, after some conversation between them, they decided to take their daughter to an abortion clinic, uh, and they killed the baby. Then the church learned about it, and the pastor confronted them. He said, why do you do that? You killed a human being. What happened? And they said to the pastor, we knew what we were doing. It was hard. But we would rather endure the judgment of God than endure the criticism of the congregation. They knew that they were committing sin against God, that they were killing a baby, but yet they felt that they would rather do that than the comment, the gossip of other people in the church. I don't know that church, and I don't pretend to understand what was going through their mind. Well, my point is, definitely that couple felt that love was not present there. You know, the local church, the local congregation, we should be a refuge for those that need help, to those that are hurting. We want to be a place in which people that are struggling, they will feel comfortable being there. We want to be a place where those that are fragile and vulnerable, they will want to be there because they know that they will be loved. Even when we walk with someone through church discipline, we do that because we love them. So the local church, the way that John is describing the church here and, and through the whole New Testament is basically saying, like, we want to be a place where 
that young man that is struggling with pornography, he will feel comfortable coming to another brother and say, brother, I need help, help me. We want to be a place in which a lady that is struggling with anxiety will say, help me, I'm struggling with this. Where a brother who's a professional who's struggling with depression will come to another brother and say, brother, help me, I don't know what to do. We want to be that place, and that's the picture that John is presenting us here, where we love one another because we have been loved by God, and by being loved by God, we will love others. Brothers and sisters, love others because you can. Love distinguishes true Christianity from false Christianity. We were created to love, but we have turned that love from God, and we have made ourselves the object of that love, but that is not love, that is idolatry. True love is grounded in the one who is love in himself. And when we love him, we will love others. Remember what we see here in the text, in the Bible. It is not that we have to love others so that God will love us, no. It is that because we have been loved by God, we will love others. It is not like, I will love so that God will love me. No, it is because you have been loved in Christ, you will love others. I grew up uh, in the Dominican Republic, uh, in a small town in the northeast part of the country. Uh, and I, I, was, I, I played baseball when I was growing up. So my dream was to be a major league baseball player. It did not work. And so when I was around 14, I was playing a lot. I was practicing running in the beach every morning and practicing ba baseball. I had a coach. I remember my coach said, like, Edgar, you're weak. You need muscles. You go, need to go to the gym. So he sent me to a gym. I mean, I grew up in a small town. Uh, the gym there was not like the gyms that we have here. It was like, it was in the backyard of a house. And the discs were not like the one we have today. They were made out of cement. And, and I remember when, when I went there, uh, I put, I think, 20 pounds, 20 pounds, I think it was 40 pounds, and I was struggling in the bench. I could not do it. But there was a guy, he was called Ludovino. We call him Ludo. It's like 6'3". And, and he would come, he would put like, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, and like nothing. And he would just keep going, like I think 300 pounds like in the bench, and he would just do like nothing. And he'd keep going, and then, then he would come, take like a juice, and put like a green powder, shake that, and then drink it. I think that was illegal. And, <laughs> and he was drinking that, and then he would take something to measure his arm. You know, when he was working out, he would measure his arm. And I think his arms were bigger than my legs. And, and then he would look himself in the mirror. And, and I said, like, who's this guy? He must be a vigilante or something, fighting criminals in the street. Well, no, well then I learned that he was a paralegal. He was basically typing a computer all day. And I said, well, that doesn't make sense to me. Well, I think we as Christians can be like that. We receive the, Lord, the love of God, and then we do nothing. We just look ourselves in the mirror. And God did not love you so that you will feel comfortable with yourself. He loved you that he will love him and love others. But you will say, well, but there are some people that are difficult to love. There are people that I struggle to love. And I would say, yes, there are people that are difficult to love. But what I would ask you is, think for a moment about that person that you struggle to love. Think about that person that you feel like is impossible to love. That person that comes to your mind is perhaps the best illustration that you have in your life of the way that God has loved you. It was that difficult for God to love you because he gave his only son for you. 
he sent his son to die in the cross, to be nailed at the cross for you. That difficult it was for God to love you, yet he loved you. So perhaps that person is God placed that person in your life so that you will grow in the image and the knowledge of God. A friend of mine who's a pastor, he wrote a book uh, entitled The Compelling Community. In that book he says, our love is proportional to our, our understanding of forgiveness. And because our forgiveness is supernatural, we have the ability as Christians to love God supernaturally. And when we love God, we love others. You see, this love is not empowered by the lovability of others or our own goodness. No, it is empowered by the supernatural forgiveness that we have received in Christ Jesus. Love between believers is not a sign of maturity. It is a sign of saving faith. And I will repeat that. Love among Christians is not a sign of maturity. It is a sign of saving faith. If we have been saved in Christ, we will love others. We are called to cultivate this love. How can we do it? We meditate on the cross. For sure, there are some people that are difficult to love. And for sure, we have been that for God. Yet, he loves us in Christ Jesus. The more, the, the, more, the younger you are, the more we tend to think that love is just happens. It's like butterfly in the stomach. It is not. Love is, is intentional. We seek that love. We cultivate that love. I didn't wake up this morning and I was wondering if I love my wife. I love her and I pursue that love. And I want to grow in that love and I work for that. So we see that in Christ Jesus at the cross. The cross was not an accident. The whole Bible is like, you say, the cross is like a shadow in the whole Bible. Everything is pointing to the cross. In fact, when, like, uh, Matthew 16, when, you know, when the first confession of the disciple of who, who he was, he asked them, who, who do people say I am? Yeah, you say, some people say, well, some say that you are Elijah, some say that you're John the Baptist, that you are one of the prophets. And then he asked them, so what about you? Who do you think I am? And then Peter, Peter says, well, you are the son of the living God. And then the, the Lord said, well, my father who is in heaven revealed that to you. So they move on. And then he, the Lord Jesus, in that chapter 16 of Matthew, he tells them, like, well, I have to go to Jerusalem, and I will be uh, crucified, and I will be beaten, and I will die. And then Peter says, who just confessed him, said, whoa, 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 no, don't do that. So then Peter comes and he confronts the Lord. And he said, no, you, don't, you should not die. You should not suffer. And then the Lord Jesus, God in the flesh, said to Peter, apart from me, Satan. He called Peter Satan. I mean, that's a strong rebuke coming from the Lord himself. And why? Because anyone that tries to separate Jesus from the cross is from Satan. Because it's at the cross that he killed death and the one that had the power of death. Amen. It is through his death that he gave us life. Amen. So we see that. Is that intentional? He's looking forward to the cross. Not because it was good or fun. It's because in, through the cross, through his death and resurrection that he healed us. That he saved us. That he makes us new. So that intentional is how God has loved us. He has pursued you. And that's the way that we have to love others. God has been patient with us. He has endured our own doubts and our sin. So we have to be patient with others. 
So this should teach us to be quick to forgive and slow to be offended. I assume some of you have been offended by others in the church. If you have not, I would say most likely you will be offended. When that happens, remember the way that God has loved you. Remember the way that he has been patient with you. And remember the way he has treated you. Look at the cross and look at the way that God has loved you. To conclude, I have three main practical applications. One, be present. One, be present. Uh, Pastor Andrew, and I will say this, not for, it's not because I have seen something here, it's because of my own church. Be present. I think it is very common today among many churches, among many Christians, to see church almost like a place where I go to get something. And then I miss church because I went to the beach, and then next week I miss church because I went to a game, and then next week I miss because I did something. Honestly, I think that is unloving. The church is not where I go to get Thompson. The church is where I go to give my life with others. You cannot love those who you do not know. There's a relationship between knowledge and love. We love God because we know him and we have been known by him. You cannot love those who you do not know. That brother or that sister that you feel is difficult to love, instead of avoiding them, try to get to know them. Don't just come right about before the sermon, after the announcement, sit down, and after the sermon, leave. I don't think that's loving. Get to know others. Ask them, how can you pray for them? Have real and meaningful conversation. Be present. Second, pray for one another. Pray for one another. Uh, in my church, for example, we have a uh, kind of a directory of all the members of the church, all the covenant members of the church, with information, phone number, address, uh, family information, and a picture. I think it's healthy, like you take, if you, something like that, I take it, and I pray for people in the congregation. And sometimes I send them an email, like, hey, brother, I pray for you. There's any way that I can pray? for you, more specific ways that I can pray for you? I will tell you something. That person that you struggle to love, pray for them. You know what? I think it is impossible to hate someone that you pray for. I don't think you can hate someone that you pray for. And you know what is the beauty of that? Just the wisdom of God. So he used those prayers, not only to answer the prayers that you bring in before him for that person, but also his shaping and changing your own heart as you pray for others. He's using those prayers to make you more like Jesus. So that prayer is not like for the person that only that you're praying for, but it's also God is using that to change you. So pray for those that you struggle to love. And third, love others by proclaiming the gospel. Love others by sharing the gospel. If the cross of Christ is God's greatest manifestation of love, evangelism is our greatest manifestation of love. The way we tell people, the greatest way that we can tell others that we love them when they're not Christian is by sharing the gospel with them. I, I was, uh, a couple of years ago, I read a book uh, uh, about discipleship. And in this book, I remember the author, I think it was The Trellis and the Vine. And in that book, the author was making a, a reference to a stand-up comedian in Australia. This stand-up comedian in Australia was an was a atheist. He rejected any, any, any assistance, the existence of God. He rejected God himself. So this atheist, a stand-up comedian, 
One day, understanding the logic of the gospel, he said, if you believe that we all are sinners, and the only way to be reconciled to God, to be made new, to have eternal life, is by repenting of my sin and putting my faith in Christ, and if you believe that and you don't tell me that, you must hate me. Because if you don't tell me that, it's because you want me to go to hell. This is a non-Christian just following the logic of the gospel. So if you're a high school student and you don't want to share the gospel with your friend because you'll be weird, be weird and share the gospel because you love them enough. Share the gospel with your non-Christian friend because you love them. That's the reason we do it, because we love God and we love them. Even when we feel awkward or strange, we do that because we love them. Because we are more concerned about their own soul than what they would think about us. Love others. Share the gospel with them. I have a friend who's a medical doctor. He was working in, in New York in a hospital, and, and he was meeting with this non-Christian friend, and he would share the gospel with them. And then the friend said, uh, so you want to convert me? And he said, uh, yes. And then he asked, but do you love me? And my friend was shocked. He didn't know what to do. He was sharing the gospel just to check a box. And he was confronted by a non-Christian who asked, but do you love me? Brothers and sisters, we love the non-Christian so much that we share the gospel with them because we love them, because we want them to repent of their sin, to put their faith in Christ, and to enjoy that loving relationship, that relationship with the Lord Jesus. And that's the reason that the missionaries that Pastor Andrew was presenting today, they went overseas, not because it's comfortable. They went overseas because they love the nations, and they love God, and they've been obedient to a call in their life, and they go overseas to share the gospel, to proclaim the name of Christ where the name of Christ has not been proclaimed. They put their own life at risk because it's worthy. And I was talking with a friend. He lives, uh, Josh, he lives in Djibouti. And he was like crying, like he said, I brought not only, I didn't just come here with my wife, I brought my daughters, say my four and six and eight years old. And I did that. And he was in Afghanistan before that. And I did that because Jesus is worthy. And he's worthy for the nations to proclaim his name. And he went, so Augustine, who was a pastor in Africa, in the fourth, in the fifth century, North Africa, he was a theologian and a pastor. He said, love God and do whatever you want. And he said that because he knew that when you love God, everything else will be shaped by that. If we love God, we will love others and we will love the nations. Let's pray together.